Hello and welcome. Thank you for visiting Olympia Orthopedics YouTube page. This is the first of what's going to be many videos that we are putting together to help you have a better experience through your surgical procedure. Today, I'd like to talk to you about robotic spine surgery. I'm Andrew Minista, I'm one of the doctors here, and I'm the director of the robotic spine surgery program. If you're watching this video, you probably have an interest in robotic spine surgery, or perhaps you're getting ready for an upcoming procedure. Today, I will be talking about a robotic-assisted transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. We would call that a T-lift. This is a procedure where we make more room for your nerves and better align your, the bones of your spine and hold them in place permanently. The process of making more room for your nerves is known as a decompression, oftentimes referred to medically as a laminectomy. And the process of linking your bones together permanently in a better position would be known as a fusion. As you prepare for this procedure, you may have questions as, what can I expect? Will it hurt a lot? What will I need at home? What are my restrictions afterwards? To be honest, in the 10 years that I've been doing this procedure in Olympia, Olympia, Washington, those questions have different answers. The technologies have changed, the medicines have changed, and our procedures have changed. And so one of the issues about making a video is that oftentimes the information can come out of date. This is why with these videos, we will be aging these out every 12 months and creating a new video with the most current recommendations. As of today, April 2018, we would expect that these would be the most current and accurate recommendations in regards to a robotic assisted T-lift. Number one, with any surgery, there's risks of infection. We do ask you to use a special wipe on your body either the evening before or the morning of the surgery that will help cut down on your body's natural bacteria. We will be using antibiotics through your IV in the hospital for the surgery and for the day afterwards. And we'll be using strict sterile technique. And by doing this, we can effectively eliminate the vast majority of infections. A lot of people worry about damage to their nerves during these procedures. For the most part, damage to the nerves can be avoided by strict, careful surgical technique, the use of robotics to help guide the instrumentation, and the use of neuromonitoring so we follow your nerves along. If one of them starts to show strain or stress, it will show up electronically and we're aware of it at the time it occurs, and we can reverse whatever we did at that point. You may have an opportunity to speak with the neuromonitoring technician prior to your surgery, Another one of the risks that we worry about with surgery is will we get the desired result? This is why we're actively involved in research. We want to make sure that we can do these surgeries better, that we can make sure they're being done for the right reasons, and we can get the vast majority of people the best possible outcome. You will be asked to fill out surveys multiple times before and after your surgery that help us better study and understand what we're doing and make the experience better, not just for you, but for the people that are coming after you. Now when it comes to what to expect for the surgery, you will be waking up early in the morning, you'll be coming to the hospital and you'll be hungry and missing that first cup of coffee. It is very important that your stomach be empty. You will be having surgery where you will be in a prone or face down position and the anesthesiologist will need to have complete control of your airway. This puts you at risk for aspiration if there is material in your stomach. So please, we ask you to not have anything to eat or drink after midnight and keep that stomach nice and empty for us. I know it's an inconvenience, but it's done for your own safety. You will arrive at the hospital and check in and the uh, nursing staff and anesthesiologist will meet you, and start an IV and review some basic questions with you. Many of these are questions that you've had asked before. Do you have any allergies? Have you ever had any surgeries before? Is there metal elsewhere in your body? You may feel like these questions are redundant, and they are, but there is safety and redundancy, and please bear in mind that every member of these staff is trying to help you have a safer experience. You will get a chance to meet your surgeon. They will mark on your backside where the surgery is about to occur uh, in general terms with their initials and go over the consent form with you. Ask and answer any questions that you may have. You will then be wheeled off into the operating room 
where you will be administered general anesthesia, and you will have no recollection of those events. At that point, while you are asleep, uh, the neuromonitoring agent will put uh, leads into your arms and legs so we can monitor your nerves. The nursing staff will, uh, in many instances, insert a catheter into your bladder, and we will use a special device called a sequential compression device to help prevent blood clots in your legs. You'll be rolled into a special frame that will hold your body in a safe position while we do the surgery, and padding will be used to augment any areas of your body that need it. Once you're safely positioned, warm blankets will be placed, antibiotics will be administered, and you will be prepared with a special uh, antibacterial soap on your back and draped with sterile surgical cloths, and the surgery will be about to begin. When we're about to start surgery, we go through a checklist, just like the airline pilots do, where we're going to make sure that we have the right person, that we know their allergies, that we're all on the same page as to what procedure we're doing, that the relevant equipment is there, that any medicines that we need would be there, if there are any anticipated problems that can occur. If you happen to be diabetic, we'll be checking your blood sugar and reviewing that. If you're on a beta blocker, we'll be confirming that as well. Once we've gotten through the checklist, we'll then begin the surgery. A robotic-assisted T-lift is a surgery that involves the use of quite a bit of equipment, including uh, x-ray equipment. Um, the surgery itself uh, depends on how many levels are being done, how big you are, and uh, whether you've had previous surgery, but generally it takes roughly between an hour and a half to three hours to do, depending on those factors. Upon completion of the surgery, you will be taken out of the surgical drapes that we had you in once your bandage is applied and rolled onto a hospital bed where the anesthesiologist will wake you up and take you to the recovery room. While you're at the recovery room, you may start to remember things at that moment but we expect that you will have minimal discomfort uh, as during the surgery we will be administering medicines directly into the spinal cord that will keep you comfortable. Once you've reached the appropriate requirement, requirements for transfer up to the floor, you, where the nurses will introduce themselves and attend to your needs that evening. You will see your surgeon the following morning. Throughout the night, be checking to make sure that you can move and wiggle your toes and that you can feel sensation on your thighs and legs. This is just a safety precaution and it is standard uh, care. Your vital signs, your blood pressure, your heart rate, and your temperature will be checked frequently. I wouldn't expect that you're gonna get a lot of sleep that first night, but you will get several naps throughout the evening. Depending on when your surgery is done, you will either start working with physical therapy the day of surgery or the morning after surgery. I would anticipate that most people if they have their surgery first thing in the morning, they'll meet the therapist that afternoon. If they have surgery in the afternoon, the following morning. Uh, and that is a generally safe rule of thumb for the way that we're currently doing that today. The expectation is that we get you up and moving within the first 24 hours. This is so we can prevent pneumonia, we can limit the exposure to blood clots, and that we can get your back muscles firing again so they can start the healing process. It may feel like they're kicking you out of bed, but the nurses and the therapists are trying to mobilize you quickly so that you can have the safest and quickest recovery. At the hospital, you'll be given a choice of what you can eat. This is done with a menu. There are some limitations, however, and for diabetics and cardiac patients, you'll have further limitations on your carbohydrates and sodium. Again, we want like you to have the choice of what you ha can have to eat, have some control over that part of your situation, uh, but there are limits when you're cooking at an institution. Hopefully you'll have a relatively good experience. Um, in fact, I hope you have an excellent experience. And I would say that with the way that we are currently controlling pain in the hospital, that generally we can get people uh, through the first couple days with minor discomfort. Once you have reached the ability to walk independently and have adequate pain control with pills alone, uh, you're just about ready for home. There is one issue that I haven't talked about yet, and that is that catheter that was inserted while you were asleep prior to the surgery. That catheter for your urine will be removed, and you have to be able to urinate afterwards. 
In general, once you can urinate, once you can walk, and once your pain is controlled with pills, you're safe to go home. There are other mitigating factors that might be involved, such as abnormalities in your lab work that will be checked daily. But for the most part, once you meet those three criteria, you are able to return to your own home. So let's talk about what are some barriers to getting you back to your own home. Do you have a lot of stairs? Is there a bedroom and the same floor that there's a bathroom? Where is your kitchen located? Who's there to help you? Are there small pets around? And do you have throw rugs and other small items on the floor that you could trip over and hurt yourself? Getting your home ready for surgery is important. And my advice to you would be to start thinking about those things prior to the surgery. I do expect that the vast majority of patients with a robotic assisted T-lift will be able to walk on their own uh, with the aid of a walker. But a full flight of steps multiple times a day would present a barrier to most patients within the first week or two of, of uh, major back surgery. So that's something to think about. Grab bars in the bathroom for the shower or for the toilet can be very uh, helpful. And there are some devices that can sit upon your commode that will raise the toilet seat up that can also be very helpful. And these are things that you can talk with the pre-op coordinator, the surgery scheduler, or even the surgeon themselves, and they can point you in the right direction. It will need to be individualized for your house, your current physical capabilities, but in general, those things are helpful. If you live alone, you may need a home health care aid to come help you uh, after your surgery, and getting that set up in advance is really critical. Uh, you'll feel a lot better and a lot much more secure if you go home and you know that a helper will be there later that day. This is, this is something that we can set up for you beforehand. We want to make sure that that's done uh, in advance. Likewise, your nutrition at home is very important. Same way that we want you to follow a good healthy diet in the hospital, we'd like you to do that at home as well. And in particular, after a low back surgery, you need protein to heal the wound. This is not a time to begin a diet. This is not a time to restrict certain foods. I would encourage you to have plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables and to make sure that you're getting a full daily serving of protein in your diet. This will help you heal faster and provide you the energy that you need. It is not uncommon that while on narcotic pain medicine uh, in your recovery, that you will have constipation. You may not feel like eating a lot. It's important that you eat and I would encourage you to have five small meals a day if, even if you don't feel hungry to make sure that you have the calories and the protein necessary to heal your wound and to fuse your spine. Activity after spinal surgery. Wasn't that long ago that spinal surgeons used to tell people to lay down, have bed rest. We now know that that's actually not helpful and we encourage you to walk more and more every day. I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes here in Olympia, Washington, the weather is not conducive to walking outdoors in which case you may be burning a hole around a ring in your house. If you walk from the living room to the dining room to the kitchen and back, that's a walk. And if you do it an extra time every day, you will have walked farther and farther every day. So even if the weather is a barrier to walking outside, you can still get the exercise done in the house. It will take some self-discipline, and I would encourage you to keep a track, either on a note card or a small diary, of how much walking you're actually doing. It is important that you get up and move. It'll protect your lungs. It'll also help with the constipation. You should have a follow-up appointment with the physician, your surgeon or uh, their PA, uh, in roughly two weeks after the surgery. This is generally a wound check. If there are any staples or, or stitches that need to be removed, they're often removed at that visit, although that's a decision that's made at that time looking at the wound. Check an x-ray. In fact, it might be the first time you get to see what your new insides look like and it's a lot of fun to compare the prior image to the new image and see the new and improved you. I would encourage you to take a copy of that x-ray home, either uh, digitally on your camera phone or even a photocopy picture, put it up on your fridge, and remind yourself of everything you've been through. There might be some times where you get a little discouraged and you can look at those pictures and remember, hey, I'm doing a pretty good job. Been through a big surgery and I'm doing okay. Hopefully that inspires you to walk a little farther. There is one piece of equipment that I'd like you to leave the hospital with, and that's an incentive spirometer. It's a plastic device that you breathe into, and it helps keep your lungs full. This will help decrease the chance of getting a fever, 
or having uh, pneumonia develop. The nurses will instruct you on how to use that at the hospital, but I would encourage you to take it home and be disciplined using it there as well. After your two-week visit, things get a little bit easier. You will find that you won't require as much pain medicine, that your ability to walk and get up out of bed and move around gets easier, and every day should be a slight nudge in the right direction. If you were to look at a videotape of you from day one and compare it to day 15 or 16, the change can be dramatic, but when you're living it day to day to day, sometimes it'll seem like a slow crawl. By the time you come to see your surgeon at the six week visit, you should have made significant improvements in your walking ability, in pain control, and uh, in your general health. You'll oftentimes check an x-ray at that visit and compare to make sure that nothing is loosening. The next visit after that is the 12 week visit. There, x-rays will be taken this time with you bending back and forth and that'll be done to make sure that the fusion has taken and that the bones are united enough that we can get you off of the no bending, twisting, heavy lifting restrictions. I didn't forget to mention the brace. I saved it for this part because the 12 week visit is when you get to liberate yourself from those restrictions. And that's wearing the brace when you're out of bed and limiting how much lifting, bending, and twisting that you can do. I would say that in my practice, this is the one thing I ask of patients that they find the most difficult. It's done because, at least at 2018, our current understanding is that your body does need some stability in order for those bones to heal. And by not repeat, repeatedly stressing that area with bending and twisting, that we can get the bones to heal faster and better. Congratulations after 12 week visit for getting off those restrictions. At this point, you're free to do pretty much whatever you want with your back. And we'll see you back at your six month, one year, two year, and four year post-operative visits for surveys, x-rays, and hopefully a nice social visit. I know I didn't address every single one of the questions or concerns that people have about surgery, particularly about robotic assisted transframmal lumbar interbody fusion, but these are many of the questions and expectations that people have asked me and queried me about over the years, and I hope this is a good step in the right direction for you. Hope you have a speedy recovery and please check out some of our other videos as we get them up and running on our page. Thank you and have a good evening.